it was a difficult show to do. I was assigned to, she wanted to do a history of the Adams, the historical Adams family from John and Abigail in the, in the Revolutionary War down through Sherman Adams and um, all the current Adamses that are alive, whose names I don't even remember, in about a 13 or 14 part series for public television is what it was. And she was, uh, again, we were working for minimum, but that was all right. This was a, a I, I didn't, I never minded working for minimum, except if I didn't see that something was, uh, uh, that it wasn't going well, as in some projects, you know. It, uh, uh, but you did, uh, there was a certain amount of giving back that you ha always had to do if you were a, a, a successful writer in, in any medium, I think. And this was very worthwhile. And it was good, it was going to be used in schools, and it was going to be used for historical purposes. And so I was glad to do it. And I was rather dismayed when I found I was to write about John Quincy Adams because he always seemed to be such a Stuck, uh, stick in the mud, you know, or whatever that expression is, you know, he's a stuffy man. And I thought, well, he doesn't sound like much fun. Until I got to reading about him and discovered fun, he was a laugh riot. I loved him. I used to call him Johnny Q, and they, which the historians did not appreciate. They didn't like it that I was calling their John Quincy Adams. I said, well, Johnny Q always felt to this way. <laughs> but Doing research, I don't like research, as I've said, and I think that you can get too much research. So I asked for a history of the Adams family up through John, and up through his children, actually, and then uh, one, a book focusing on his life. Now, in addition to that, he had 19 volumes of diaries and I think 17 volumes of journals. One was public and one was private, and I had to scan all those. I didn't read them all. But I got to work on it and I, to find the stories, and it was so easy to find the stories because he was a really a remarkable man who never was meant to be president. But And Adams was put in the crib and they said, you've got to be president, you know. And so the poor man, the time came and he was president and he was not a good president. And then he left the White House and he was asked to run for the House of Representatives from Quincy, Massachusetts. And he did. And his wife said, how? You've been president. How can you go into the House of Representatives? He said, I needed the, the per day diem, uh, the per diem that they give me every day, expenses, you know fabulous sense of humor. And of course, there he bloomed. He became known as old man, eloquent. He loved, he loved the ladies. He could flatter them and flirt with them. He, he was the first man to get the word abolition spoken on the House of Representatives floor. You could not say the word. He got it said, and again, and again, and again. He was a marvelous man. I, I don't think I've enjoyed any scripts that I did as much as I enjoyed writing about John Quincy Adams, whom they told me was a bore. And so dramatic, and the events of his life, and his, his equanimity, and his dealing with them fairly, and his quirks, and lovely incidents which I couldn't use, such as he loved to go skinny dipping when he was in the White House and in the Potomac. And one day there was a young woman who wanted to interview him for a newspaper, and she came and sat in his clothes, and wouldn't let him, wouldn't let get up until he came, gave her an interview. And he was naked in the water, so he had to give her this. Well, now this is this is a fun fellow to have around. I think <laughs> I loved him, and I loved doing the project. And if the problem was with the project, that out of I was nine and ten, I believe, out of thirteen or fourteen, and I really. We were all writing at the same time, and I had no idea what went into the scripts before me. So ordinarily, you could rely on, I came into his life when he was um, oh, 30 or 40, something like that. Well, he was married with children when I came into it, my episode. And you would assume that the episodes before would have explained his marriage and this, that, and the other thing. But I decided I was not going to trust that at all. So I put it all in. I put everything in. Thank heaven I did, because nothing had been explained about him. She couldn't make up her mind how the series was going to be presented. First it was going to be John Adams looking forward, and he'd be the voiceover, because you needed a voiceover with all the historical 
data that had to be dispensed. Then it was going to be Sherman Adams looking back, and then it was going to be Walter Cronkite, you know, looking at it from Martha's Vineyard, I guess. And then it was going to be this, and she couldn't make up her mind. And I thought, well, I'm going to write mine so that you don't need a voiceover at all. And I did. And I think they're two of the best, <laughs> the two of the best, because they were complete in themselves. And they did put some voiceover because there were a few things that I didn't get in, which they thought I should have been in. But all the essential facts were there and were made part of the story. And I loved doing it. It was one of the most rewarding uh, television things I did. And I'm, in a way, for that reason, I'm so glad it was my last, you know, because I, from my point of view, I went out and went out with f fun and also there's very little of my writing, looking back, that I really like. Very little. 